This evening is uh, Gareth Leng, who's actually here at uh, Edinburgh University. Um, and um, I know that Gareth's been involved in all sorts of outreach activities um, and really enjoys kind of having the opportunity to talk about his research with a, a kind of different audience. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Gareth and ask him to tell us all about the loving brain, monogamy to maternity. Thanks very much, uh, Louise. Uh, I guess many of you here will think that scientist has got no business talking about love. Um, now, I'm not going to be talking about love. I'm not an expert on love. Nor uh, am I an expert on the trust hormone or the cuddle hormone or the moral molecule. Uh, and so please don't... Uh, confuse that. I'm going to be talking, if you don't mind, about oxytocin, mostly. Now, what's a scientist got to be interested in about monogamy? Surely our choice of a partner for life is a matter for the kind of higher centers. Don't we do that on some rational basis? I'm not sure that we do. I suspect there's something rather instinctive and random about our choices. Not quite random. Random's not the right word. Anyway, where we come to and why love is anything to do with oxytocin is something I'm going to talk to you about. But you've probably seen it all. I know this is a public lecture, and I actually, I don't know what speaking to the public is like, really. Does anybody really speak to the public? They can, and, and I think most of you are physiologists, and you don't really count as members of the public, I guess. <laughs> I, I, I think, you know, you talk to people. I suppose the difference between this lecture for me and the lectures that I usually give to students or to other scientists is that when you're talking to students or other scientists, you don't actually expect them to be listening. <laughs> um, and here tonight, I know I've got a horrible fear that some of you might be. Anyway, some of you, or many of you, will have seen some of the newspaper headlines about oxytocin. Love hormone oxytocin helps soldiers like each other and hate the enemy. Oxytocin polarizes men's opinions of their mothers. Oxytocin, the love hormone, could cure shyness. Oxytocin, the trust hormone, could become a new interrogation tool. Trust, drug, may cure social phobia. And finally, oxytocin, could the trust hormone rebond our troubled world? Well, by the end of today, I think you'll have some idea of my answer to that, though probably some of you will have guessed that I think probably the answer is no. Thank you, Wikipedia. They produced this for me. Oxytocin is produced in a part of the brain called the hypothalamus, conveniently highlighted there by Wikipedia in, in red. You'll notice it's right at the heart of the brain. Basically, for those of us who work on the hypothalamus, the rest of the brain is just stuffing. It's there to protect the hypothalamus. <laughs> because the hypothalamus really does, does everything important, everything that really matters to us, for ourselves, for our humanity, for our health. Let's have a look at this photograph. It's a classic photograph, I think, of love. I don't know what you see in that photograph. I mean, what do you see in that? You see a couple kissing. Look at the woman. How is she responding to that kiss? Is it welcome? Is it forced upon her? Look at it as a physiologist for a moment. The head thrown back, the arched back, slightly raised buttocks. 
It's a classic lordosis posture. We know about this in animals. <laughs> lordosis is the response of virtually all mammals to show that they're sexually receptive, that they're ready to be mounted by the male. <clears throat> of course, that whole reflex is controlled, the lordosis reflex is controlled by the hypothalamus. Got another more classic image of the kiss from Rodan. Much less erotic in some ways. She's not showing that posture. This is kind of interesting, though. What is this about? It's really about the difference in physiology, the muscles, and the sharp contours of the male, the soft contours and softness of the female. This difference in form is produced by a difference in steroid hormone production that is controlled, of course, by the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus itself is what we call sexually dimorphic. A male will have a different hypothalamus than a female. So sexual dimorphism and this body structure is controlled by the hypothalamus. And so is circadian rhythm, our body rhythms, the way we differ between day and night. There's a master clock in the, in the hypothalamus called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And this controls all of our daily rhythms, including for most mammals, sexual responsiveness. That varies between day and night as well. But it does many more things. Hypothalamus controls how tall we're going to be, controls the release of a hormone called growth hormone. And, of course, it controls our appetites, controls the fat composition. And actually, there's an interesting regulation, cross-regulation, between our appetite and sex and love, which also is controlled by oxytocin. And, of course, it controls our responses to stress and our blood pressure. And that's even without thinking that the hypothalamus controls every stage of this journey from sexual behavior to mating to, con to, to conception to through pregnancy and interlactation. Every stage in that journey is under the control of this little part of the brain called the hypothalamus. And oxytocin only does only one small part of this myriad of actions. But all of these things, this journey that is controlled by the hypothalamus, isn't just true of mammals. It's true of all mammals, not just humans, but also all vertebrates. In fact, it is this that makes the hypothalamus really kind of important to study, because what the functions of the hypothalamus have been conserved through evolution, all the way through mammalian evolution. That means that essentially what the hypothalamus of a rat does is the same as what the hypothalamus of a human does. And what we discover through our experiments in laboratory animals translates very swiftly and directly into an impact on human understanding and human health. But I'm going to start this talk really with this image. This is a painting by Tintoretto. hangs in the National Gallery. It's called The Origin of the Milky Way. It's painted about 400 years ago. We need to look carefully at this. It's a, because artists are great artists because of their eyes, because of what they see. And I want to think, what do you see in that painting? Again, as a physiologist now, what do you see in that painting? As the baby is suckling at one breast, there's milk coming out of the other. Now, what does that tell you? It embodies an important truth. Getting milk from a breast is not like drinking milk from a bottle. Oh, it's more fun, but it's the really, it, it just doesn't come like that. It's, it comes from the breast. It's let down into the breast from where the baby can get it by suckling because of a reflex. It's a reflex that involves this hormone of oxytocin. We know that. Really, Tintoretto knew it. The baby sucks at one breast, then it's not just that breast that responds by letting down milk. The other breast does as well. There has to be some message communicated by that suckling that somehow reaches that other breast. So what happens, we know, is that the stimuli from the suckling infant, infant and carried by nerves up into the brain to the hypothalamus of the mother. And those signals cause the release of this hormone oxytocin that doesn't just travel to this gland, 
it travels around the whole body. The kind of beautiful, classic physiological reflex. In fact, here in Edinburgh, Sharpie Schaefer, who was the chair of physiology here at the turn of the century, was actually the first person to give oxytocin to a lactating mother and observe that it caused milk letdown in the human. And he reported that for the first time to this society in, I think, 1905. So what's going on in the hypothalamus? Oxytocin is released from the pituitary gland, but it's made by nerve cells in the hypothalamus. And this is a section through the hypothalamus of a rat. And these cells in red, here and here, these are the cells that are making oxytocin. The green ones are the ones making vasopressin. It's a related hormone. I'll come to again later. Mostly, though, I'm going to talk about these oxytocin neurons. I'm going to take you on a journey with those oxytocin neurons. See exactly what they happen. So this is a rat hypothalamus, but actually a human hypothalamus looks much the same. And of course, the hypothalamus does a lot more than make vasopressin and oxytocin. All of these gaps aren't just empty. They would be if it was the cortex, but it's the hypothalamus. They're not just empty. We know that they're filled with populations of neurons that control all of the other things that I, I began by mentioning. Interesting, all of those other populations also make peptides, but different peptides. In the hypothalamus, we know it makes about 100 different peptides. There's a huge complexity here of signaling. But let's take a journey with one of these oxytocin cells from here in the supraoptic nucleus, and let's see what happens to that. <clears throat> so each one of those cells sends an axon, one nerve fiber, all the way down from the hypothalamus into the pituitary gland, the posterior pituitary gland. There, that single axon gives rise to about 2,000 nerve endings, many more than I've shown here. And this is the site from which oxytocin is released, and it's released into the blood. These cells don't project anywhere else, or hardly anywhere else. They have these peculiar processes called dendrites, that I'll come to later. Dendrites, classically, are the place where cells receive stimuli. If we have a look at those fibers, thanks to the work of John Morris in Oxford some time ago now, and the electron microscope, you can see what this tissue looks like. Start to get close to what oxytocin is like. Just to show it more, more clearly, all of those endings there, there's one highlighted. And in the neural lobe, in the pituitary gland, there are about 7 billion of these tiny vesicles. Each one of these contains about 85,000 molecules of oxytocin. Now, that's an awful lot. And one of these endings contains a few hundred, but altogether, that's how many there are. And that total is about a microgram of oxytocin. And the human's got about 30 micrograms. I'm sorry to give you numbers, but I want you to remember those for later. So that's the content. And this is a big content. The pituitary is storing this hormone. It's about enough to last about three weeks in the pituitary. You think that's a long time to wait. But if the release rate is increased tenfold, then it's not three weeks anymore. It's just a few days. Now, these oxytocin cells, they're electrically active. So they, they generate signals in response to... Uh, well, they generate signals all the time, really. Uh, and I'm just going to kind of give you a sense of what they kind of sound like. Because you can record the electrical activity of these cells. And when you do, then that's the kind of thing that you hear. Each one of those clicks that you're hearing is an electrical signal generated by an oxytocin cell. And this is we know that the way that these cells process and analyze information, like other neurons. So these are the tools, then, that we've got for studying these cells. And we're going to use these tools to try and understand what happens to these cells in response to suckling. We've, I've told you that Oxytocin 
mediates this milk letdown. It's a reflex we can study in the rat. And if you have a conscious rat, this is what it looks like. It's a bit actually confusing to see what's going on here. But of course, we can study it rather more easily if we uh, anesthetize the rat when the rat's asleep. Then we can now see a bit more clearly what's happening. Here are the pups suckling, and wow, look at that. Suddenly, they're all stretching like that. They've got their milk suddenly, then they settle down again. What that tells us is that when the pups are suckling, they're not getting milk all the time. They're getting it abruptly in, in spurts. And if we put a cannula in just one of those mammary glands of a rat, a rat's got about 12 of these mammary glands, and we can measure that pressure, and we can catch that spurt of oxytocin. We can see it by the effect that it has on intramammary pressure. So what's going on up in the hypothalamus? Let's pick one of those neurons in the hypothalamus and record from it. And let's just see what these cells do. Wow. Right. This time, as the pups suckle, the oxytocin cells don't do very much. They carry on as before. But then occasionally, just occasionally, they will do something else. They will generate a burst of activity. Every few minutes, they'll repeat that burst. So those bursts are repeated every few minutes for as long as the pups are suckling. Now, there's something extraordinary about this bursting behavior. Because for, it only lasts a second, this burst of the oxytocin cells, about a second. But every single oxytocin cell in the hypothalamus bursts at about the same time. So it's massively coordinated amongst all the oxytocin cells in the hypothalamus. Now, this observation, which was first made by a PhD student in Bristol, Jonathan Wakeley, was really an important one because it defined what has become known as neuroendocrinology for the generation that followed. What it said was that there's something important about pulses. A pulsatile signal is somehow important in a way that a continuous signal is not. Raise the question, why does oxytocin have to be released in pulses? It's a question that occupied people for the next 20 years because it turned out that it's not just oxytocin that's released in pulses. Every hormone that we know about, when it matters, is released in pulses. So these questions became generally important. Why are pulses so important? And how are they generated? What is it about the cells that enable them to show this bursting activity? Why do they show it only in particular circumstances? And how is it that they can all be synchronized and coordinated? Now, these are really difficult questions to answer. And actually took about 30 years really to get the answers to those. Now, let's take just kind of one of those questions. Can you imagine how difficult it is to get 10,000 cells all firing at the same time? How do you synchronize that population? Well, let's try it. I know it's always dangerous to try an experiment for the first time in front of a live audience, but let's try it, if you would. What I want you to do as an audience, imagine that you're oxytocin cells in the hypothalamus. Okay? I just want you to do something fairly simple, which is just to clap your hands, but I want you to do it all together, please, at the same time. <clears throat> in your own time. All right. Not bad, not bad, not bad. How did you do that? Let's try just clapping once and try and do that all together in the same time. Not bad. Right, you have a, the, but it is a little tricky because you had a conductor, didn't you? Can I have somebody at the back leading this? All right? I can't see anybody at the back. Can somebody right in the back row raise their hands? All right, I'd like you, in your own time, please, to clap your hands. 
And I'd like you all to clap at the same time, please. In your own time. <laughs> Not bad. <laughs> How did it work? You picked up a signal at the back that was conveyed to the ones in the front, and it was propagated amongst you. Basically, you've got to listen to each other. You've got to talk to each other in some way. Now, the problem for the oxytocin cells is how do they talk to each other? Well, why should that be a problem? They're next to each other. Well, actually, cells don't talk to each other unless something special happens. There's a mess you've got to have a message that's passed from one cell to another in order to get that synchronization. So what is the message that passes from oxytocin cell to oxytocin cell that enables them to burst together? The obvious answer is that it should be oxytocin itself. But there's a problem with that. Because these cells are only ever synchronized in, during suckling, and only then very briefly. So it's, some, it's a synchronization that only happens under particular circumstances. So, is oxytocin involved? in this kind of beautiful reflex. Let's have a look at what happens during that burst. Down at the pituitary, we know pretty well what happens. When that signal goes down, then in any one ending, those signals invade those, and a few of these vesicles will be released, and they will get into the blood. They get into the blood. They don't get back into the brain. So what is released here can't act on those oxytocin cells to cause the synchronization. Something else has got to be going on. And the breakthrough was really made in France by Francoise Mousse and Philippe Richard back in the 80s, where they did show that if you give tiny amounts of oxytocin into the brain, then it would have this dramatic and fascinating effect. Yes, if you're recording that intramammary pressure in a rat and you're looking at the reflex, you give a tiny amount into the brain and you get this extraordinary facilitation of this reflex. You get more bursts and bigger bursts and you get them very fast. What's more, for a physiologist, you can block that reflex completely by tiny amounts of an antagonist. So we know that oxytocin is involved in this reflex and is synchronizing these cells, but we know it's not oxytocin that's released into the blood. It's got to be oxytocin that's released into the brain. So where is that oxytocin coming from? We know it can't get into the blood because we can measure that. It's an experiment back done in the 80s. It's an experiment involving giving what is technically called a shed load of oxytocin into the, 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 the blood, a massive amount, and this is the rise in the blood levels that follow giving it into the blood, and in blue is what happens to the concentrations in the brain. You will see if you look very, very carefully, they go up a bit. <clears throat> Basically, though, technically, nothing really happens in the brain, even when massive amounts get into the blood. There's a blood-brain barrier. It stops it happening. So there's got to be some oxytocin released into the brain for this reflex to work. If we look closely at these cells in the nucleus, this is at the base of the brain. You see all these fibers at the bottom. These fibers <clears throat> are what we call dendrites. So let's have a look at those. If, if we look at those dendrites, they've also got these vesicles that contain oxytocin. So this has to be the site at which oxytocin is released for cells to talk to each other. But what happens at this site when we activate those fibers by electrical signals? Nothing. What's present in the dendrites is not released normally in response to electrical activity. So it's kind of, it's really a mystery. It was a mystery that was made a little bit less mysterious anyway by the work of Mike Ludwig and others here in Edinburgh. Mike Ludwig really saw the significance of something else that oxytocin cells do. Oxytocin cells have got receptors for oxytocin, but when they are exposed to oxytocin, something interesting happens. What happens is that there's a Intracellular calcium release. Calcium is released from stores inside the cell and spreads throughout the cell. It doesn't do much to the electrical activity, but there is this intrinsic message. Now, what he showed 
was the consequences of that. The consequences of that are really very interesting. If you take a dendrite now and look at that, and now expose it to oxytocin, then what's going to happen? What's going to happen is you get this rise in intracellular calcium as a result of the mobilization of intracellular stores, and then, over a few minutes after that signal, these vesicles move to the margins of the dendrite, close to the plasma membrane. Now, you take the same dendrite and you expose that to electrical stimulation. Now, electrical stimulation can trigger release. And we can see that those release events occurring at the ultrastructural level, again, thanks to the work of John Morris. So what I've said here, again, schematically, is that normally... The oxytocin cells, when they're active, they'll release from their axons into the blood. Nothing much happens between the dendrites, so the cells aren't really talking to each other at all. Now, in response to some peptides, they can mobilize intracellular pools without causing any change in activity in some cases. So you can get some release, but more importantly, in response to certain peptides, you can get this margination of the granules. And now, as a result of that, electrical activity can actually cause the cells to talk to each other. Now, this stage of priming is important because we know it can last for at least an hour after the priming stimulus. Now, if you think about what's involved here, what a peptide can do is it changes for a prolonged time the way that cells can talk to each other. It's kind of like reprogramming a circuit. It's kind of like reprogramming part of the brain. And that's what makes it interesting. It makes it interesting because this is the kind of effect that you need if you're going to have a change in behavior. And wow, oxytocin does cause important changes in behavior. If we look now at a rat at the end of pregnancy, what we know is that while a rat is giving birth, they don't make the same fuss that humans do. They give birth to about 12, and they just uh, uh, each one comes out nicely, happily, cleans it, puts it to one side. During this, this progress of parturition in the rat is controlled by pulses of oxytocin, just as the milk ejection reflex is. And just as in the milk ejection reflex, you've got oxytocin that's being released into the brain. You've got so much oxytocin being released into the brain from these dendrites, that it just doesn't stay in one part of the brain, you've got enough to penetrate and fill the entire hypothalamus and beyond with oxytocin. Now, we know again that the same kind of bursting activity is happening during parturition. Now, parturition, birth, is an extraordinary time. It's a time when for most mammals, there's a fundamental change in their behavior, a change that we call the initiation of maternal behavior. Now, in rats, you can study this kind of very conveniently. It's been done here in Edinburgh for a long time by John Russell. Let's take a look at this rat. This rat is not fat, it's pregnant. These pups aren't its own. Uh, and so what does the rat do? It doesn't go to eat them. It can be very sensible, like women. You look at small children, you be polite and sniff them, and then run away. <clears throat> you hide. And, and, and there is this, the, the rat running away and hiding. Pups are completely ignored, not going to eat them, not going to attack them, just investigate them politely. Now, let's take the same rat after she's given birth. These pups aren't around, they're strange pets. Oop. Out she goes, you drop a few pups in the cage, and what she do? She, look. She's built a nest with the paper that was lying around. And that nest is full of her own pups. And she'll go and retrieve any pups that you put in that cage. It's a behavior that apparently she won't stop. If you put 60 pups in the cage, she'll rescue them all and, and sit on top of a large mountain of pups. <laughs> now, that behavior is triggered by parturition. But you can block that behavior with an oxytocin antagonist into the brain. And in fact, you can induce that behavior in a rat before she's given birth 
by giving oxytocin into the brain. So it's a behavior that's wholly controlled and expressed in response to the brain seeing oxytocin in large amounts for the first time. Now, this was kind of been known for a long time. It's known in the, through Court Pedersen's work in the 80s. <clears throat> But that led Sukhartha, I think, first, to think that maybe this behavioral change, the bonding that happens between mother and infant that is triggered by oxytocin, maybe something similar is going on when we fall in love. Now, of course, <clears throat> when we think about bonding and falling in love, we think it's a very human thing, but it's not just humans that fall in love. In fact, these, these uh, 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 shingleback skinks, they are monogamous as well. They make lifelong bonds. Uh, in fact, lots of species do. Seahorses do. In fact, most birds do. The uh, poison mimic frog in Peru forms lifelong monogamous bonds. Many fish do. Only a few mammals. <coughs> <coughs> Of course, monogamy is not strict monogamy, but in most of these species, both the male and the female will cheat when they can when they get away with it, and often it's serial monogamy. But essentially, we're talking about a special bond that is long-lasting and lasts at least beyond the delivery of one brood or one set of offspring. <clears throat> but I suppose the star of the show has to be this species. This is the prairie vole. And it's this species, work on this species, that really made this an important story in neuroscience. And if you don't know about this story, if you remember one thing about the whole field, it is about the importance of the story in the Prairieville. Now, I don't, have many, I don't actually have any kind of slides to show you these experiments, so if you don't mind, I need a couple of volunteers. Um, what happens in the... Let me explain before you're going to jump up and volunteer. <clears throat> Let me, let me explain what happens when a, a male prairie vole meets a female prairie vole for the first time. It's a fairly kind of spectacular event. They actually mate continuously for about 36 hours. <laughs> um, you'd think it's, it's not terribly surprising something happens in their brains after that. Um, and what, what happens in their brains is, is that they form this particular affection for the individual they've mated with. And how do we know that? Um, this, this is where I'm going to need some volunteers. I'm sure you all kind of want to play the roles of the prairie voles. <laughs> uh, Louise, you're, I can see that you're, 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 you're actually dying here to, to be the part of, of, the, of the, the, the female. And Jeremy, you've got to be, <clears throat> I think. <laughs> We need another male. Uh, do, we, do, we have, do we have any more males in the audience? <laughs> no, nobody's... Oh, we've got, we've got John. We've got, we've, we've got, we've got a, a volunteer. All right. Um, Louise, thank you so much. Uh, you're the star of the show, of course. Uh, as always, it's always the women that make the choice, really. You know, we, we men are just kind of passive bystanders in the kind of uh, lottery that life is. And Anyway, John, thank you very much. Right, you know, you, I guess... Uh, you don't get a choice as to who you're going to make with. I'll let the audience vote. Uh, would, <laughs> would, you, would you like Louise to make with Jeremy or John? Uh, let, let's say, uh, <laughs> all at once shout, Jeremy or John, please. Jeremy! All right, okay, Jeremy, you, you win. I'm sorry, John. <laughs> so, right, so, so it's very simple. You're, you're female, you've met Jeremy for the first time. Jeremy, this is Louise, Louise, and Jeremy. Yeah. Anyway, right, we'll draw a veil over what happens now. Uh, it's 36 hours of interest in May. The question is a simple one. <clears throat> How do we test whether Louise will remember Jeremy? Has, he, has she really formed an affection for her? And how do we test that? Well, we, I'm afraid we take you away for a week. All right? Okay, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> you don't see each other, okay? So, Louise, right, now you're sensitive. Now, you're given the choice. A week later... Jeremy. <laughs> they can't move. They're actually staked to the ground there. You can choose to spend time with Jeremy or with John. What are you going to do? 
Absolutely right. You're going to go straight over to F. Jeremy. Now, that's what prairie voles do. There is another closely related species called the, the, the montane vole and another one called the meadow vole. I'm afraid they're completely promiscuous. And so the prairie is so, and in fact, if you were a montane vole, I'm afraid it'd be kind of a toss up whether it's John or just sorry, it would be a toss up. <clears throat> okay, so that's how we can measure that a bond has been formed. But how do we know that oxytocin is critical in that bond? I mean, if you come back in the middle, let me explain what was happening in Louise's brain in that kind of 36 hours with Jeremy here. Um, it is this intense stimulation of the reproductive tract. During that stimulation, it's causing a rush of oxytocin to your brain. And it's this oxytocin that makes you think that Jeremy somehow, against all evidence, is special. <laughs> so, how do we know? How do we know oxytocin doing? Well, I'm afraid we can do two things. Firstly, let, come, come, let, let's repeat it. Start all over again, but this time I'm going to inject you with an oxytocin antagonist into the brain. Still enjoy yourself. <laughs> but a week later, no, random, no memory at all. So you can eliminate that bond with oxytocin antagonist into the brain. And then you can do something which is even more slightly kind of perverse, John. Now, you, I'll introduce you to John. But actually, I'll stand between you. I'm not going to let you go any further than shaking hands. This time, I'm going to inject oxytocin into your brain, take you away. A week later, you're going to choose John. All right, thank you very much. So it's these. <laughs> so it's these classic experiments that tell us that, in fact, yes, oxytocin released into the brain is key in forming. Uh, that kind of that attachment, that enduring attachment. So, what's different about a prairie vole and a montane vole? The prairie vole mates for life. Montane vole, you can do the experiment forever, will never form any memory. And this is the real breakthrough. Breakthrough first made by by Tom Insull. And they show that the one big difference in the brains of these these voles was in the oxytocin receptor. They both got tons of oxytocin released, but the oxytocin is acting at different places. Now, that's a kind of massive breakthrough. It's not just the oxytocin receptor. If you think about the bonding, it's not only the female that bonds, it's also the male that bonds. Actually, you could do the same experiment with a prairie vole male, and the male would do exactly the same thing. But in the male brain, it's not oxytocin. It's that other hormone that I mentioned, vasopressin, that does it. And again, if you look at the brain of the vole, then the vasopressin receptor is expressed in different places. Why is it different peptide? Well, actually, the bond has got very different behavioral consequences for the male and the female. The female becomes soft and affectionate. The male becomes jealous and territorial, aggressive to others, but really quite different. Different pathways involved, different sites, but the same basic mechanism. Now, this is kind of fun, but does it matter? Should we be working on this at all? Now, this is Tom Insull, who did the first experiments, really, that made this story famous, the most important experiments with the prairie vole, along with Sue Carter. He's now the director of the NIH. Institute of Me Mental Health in Bethesda, uh, with a budget, I think, of 14 billion. Um, and he, in 1999, raised the possibility that, well, actually, maybe these effects on bonding are also generalize to kind of social behavior generally, and maybe if you look at defects in social behavior in humans, defects like autism, is it actually possible that there's a defect in these systems that underlie that? Well, that was a kind of speculation, really, back in 1999. <clears throat> but then Larry Young, Larry Young really made the vasopressin story famous, and he, he said that, well, actually, he generated a knockout model. He'd removed oxytocin from the mice and actually found that what they lacked was the ability to make any kind of social links at all. 
So was there something in it? Well, in the kind of years that followed, the real breakthroughs came by about 2005 when people started to do genetic studies on humans with autism. And they started coming up with evidence that, yeah, in the human autists, the oxytocin receptor gene seems to be abnormal, in, not in all cases of autism, but in many. And suddenly, this speculation in 1999 starts to look very strong indeed. Now, that is, okay, it's interesting, but autism and certain kind of classes of autism are kind of unusual. We often know that things are involved when things go wrong, but what about individuals? And these are real breakthrough papers because we know that there are individual differences in social behavior amongst us. Some of us are successful in relationships, some of us aren't. Some of us are more empathetic and generous and altruistic than others. And these extraordinary studies seem to show that these behaviors vary with individual differences in the genes for the vasopressin and oxytocin receptors. These receptors are amongst the most variable in the human genome. They occur in lots of allelic forms. And those different allelic forms seem to correlate with individual differences in behavior. That's, to me, that's quite extraordinary. <clears throat> so what is it that oxytocin is doing to assist or support social behavior? Well, we've got to look at where in the brain it's acting and what it's doing there. And this is a problem. How do we go and find out what oxytocin is doing in particular sites? I'm just going to tell you about some extraordinary experiments done in Germany recently from Val Grinovich in Heidelberg. What he did was he looked in a part of the brain called the amygdala. Now, the amygdala is important for fear responses. Why fear responses are interesting, I'll come to. But actually, the, one of the interesting things about the amygdala is that it's got almost no oxytocin at all. It's full of oxytocin receptors, but it's only got a very, very few oxytocin fibers. You know, there's one. Now, to find out what oxytocin is doing in the amygdala, what you want is a way of activating just those fibers in the amygdala and seeing what happens. <clears throat> Well, to do that, Valkrinovich used there's something that you get from green algae, this scum that you find on top of ponds. This green algae is at the top of ponds because it consists of little organisms like this that are photosensitive. They swim and move upwards. They're sensitive to light. The cells are actually excited by light. And they're excited because of the presence of a single protein, a single uh, molecule, called channel rhodopsin. So it took this light-sensitive protein, then he used an adenovirus, and he used that adenovirus to transfer this light-sensitive protein into oxytocin neurons. Now, as a result, if you now put an optical fiber into the amygdala, you could now stimulate just those oxytocin fibers. Just think, this is, this is not a cool experiment. Just those few fibers in the amygdala, he can stimulate just by flashing blue light onto them. So when you flash blue light onto those fibers, because of what he's done, then they will release oxytocin, and he showed they did, and showed the effects in the amygdala. But most importantly, he showed that just that single manipulation could eliminate a conditioned fear response in these rats. It could block fear completely. And that's a paper published just this year in the journal Neuron. So, there is something to it. Could it cure shyness? There's a real problem with this. The problem is this. A nasal spray could cure shyness? Kind of these claims that come out on a publicized newspaper aren't about delivering oxytocin in tiny amounts to the brain. They're about delivering shed loads, that's a technical term, shed loads of oxytocin up your nose. <laughs> now, 
I don't know, yeah, I'm your physiologist, just think about it. I mean, the mo most important chemical messenger in the cortex, the messenger that helps us think, is glutamate. Actually, it's the stuff that, you, that China, is abundant in Chinese food. Nobody, as far as I know, has suggested stuffing Chinese noodles up your nose is going to help you in any particular way. <clears throat> but a nasal spray containing shed loads of oxidase, let's just look at that. And in fact, all of these studies that have attracted this attention essentially come from the same manipulation, the effects of massive amounts of oxytocin up the nose. <clears throat> Actually, this is an interesting one. Um, I kind of like that idea. The assumption behind all these studies is that oxytocin is kind of wonderful. It's panacea for everything. It makes it all kind of terribly friendly. The most sinister thing of all, it makes us trust each other. Um, but it, I think this is a kind of uh, comment pointed out that actually trusting each other and uh, bonding to each other uh, is exactly what uh, uh, Nazis and racists do. And we should remember the kind of dark side of bonding, uh, which is that maternal behavior also engages pretty kind of vigorous <coughs> aggression as well. So it's not all cuddly. So when you ask, can the trust hormone rebond our troubled world, we've actually got to look kind of a bit carefully at this story. All of these studies really are based on the idea of intranasal application. Now, you're a physiologist, you will know that the nose is not a ventilator shaft on the brain. And, you know, as you breathe in deeply, you don't get this draft rustling through our neurons. You know, our cerebellum doesn't flutter in the breeze. Actually, as physiologists, you know damn well that what goes in through the nose and you inhale deeply is a very good way of getting to your lungs. And from the lungs, of course, it's a very good way of getting into the blood. And so if you deliver shed loads of oxytocin up your nose, you will get a lot entering your blood. But you'll know, because I've already told you, that what goes into the blood doesn't get into the brain. So does anything get into the brain? Well, when I talk about shed loads, remember that number I asked you to remember before, which is the total content of the human pituitary? It's about 30 micrograms. That's as much as our brains and bodies make in a month in a normal circumstance. And how much are we actually, these guys actually giving in these tests to show effects on trust? Well, actually, the lowest dose they're giving is 80 micrograms, and some are giving up to 640 micrograms. So at one go, they're asking their volunteers to make as much hormone as is made in two months under normal circumstances, in one go. These are kind of massive amounts. When you remember that you need nanograms, millionth of the dose, to get effects on the brain. It gives so much that we can't actually exclude that some gets into the brain we can be absolutely sure that lots gets into the blood. Does that matter? Well, it does, because there are oxytocin receptors. I've told you about them in the uterus, in the mammary gland, but also in the kidney, also in the heart. Oxytocin gets in the blood with slow heart rate, and the duodenum will affect the colonic transport, the prostate gland, the vas deferens, even the penis. So actually, anything that gets into the blood can have all kinds of effects on the periphery. Now, we mightn't be particularly aware of them. Are you aware of the blood flow in your kidney at this moment, of exactly what's happening to your sperm transport? But actually, your brain is keeping track of all of these things. So if you get some effects on behavior from giving, putting shed loads of oxytocin up, in, up, your brain, up your nose, I don't find it that surprising. But, according to some people, you don't need shed loads. <clears throat> you can now buy these things. Um, and if you're worried about giving large amounts up your nose, you can even use a homeopathic form of oxytocin, <clears throat> which is, is absolutely guaranteed. They've taken enormous care to ensure that no oxytocin can possibly be present in this spray. <laughs> How much isn't present in these, they won't say, of course. Um, but uh, nonetheless, they don't hesitate to say that it's clinically proven. <clears throat> it's interesting. When, there's something curious about this. It's worth kind of 
thinking of that. Liquid trust, for instance. When you spray liquid trust on yourself, you become instantly irresistible. <laughs> <coughs> liquid trust. Be yourself at sales meetings. <laughs> Discover how strongly prospects want to buy from you. Instead of feeling suspicious of you, they're now strangely attracted to you and your product. Now, you've got to think about this. What are you supposed to do with this stuff? And spray it yourself on the day so that you exude this mist of oxytocin so everybody will trust you. Just think. You're spraying it on yourself. You're spraying it on yourself. You're going to be trusting yourself. <laughs> you know, I'm trusting everybody else. As a salesman, is it really kind of a good idea that you are surrounded by a mist that makes you trust all the people you're trying to sell to? I should test it out. I think you should test it out. Will they trust you enough to accept a promise to pay them next week? <clears throat> so can we call it a love hormone? Can we call it a trust hormone? Can we call it a cuddle hormone? I've told you that oxytocin is present in every mammal. Is it present in every vertebrate? You've got to go down the evolutionary tree to find out where it began. If you look in, in leeches, they don't have two hormones. They don't have oxytocin. They have a single hormone that's an ancestor of both. And what they do in the leech, it controls sexual behavior. In the earthworm, they've again got a single ancestor molecule of the moral molecule. They have you know, an early moral molecule. The earthworm <coughs> controls mucus secretion and egg laying. Here's the, the pond snail, my favorite, actually. That has got a single ancestral uh, peptide. Uh, it innervates the penis. <coughs> But I guess the favorite of all is the octopus, because the octopus is the most simple animal that has both an oxytocin and a vasopressin. It's the only invertebrate known so far to have those both. So oxytocin, the moral molecule, the trust hormone, starts in the octopus. So maybe calling it cuddle hormone is actually the right thing. So. I've got so many people to thank. I've shamelessly used results from colleagues and friends from all around the world. Because people in Edinburgh have contributed in their way to the story, many of them are here. And so I thank them and thank you all for listening.